In this video, I'm going to show you how I shot my most recent horror film, Stay at Home, with no money and no crew during a pandemic. I suggest you watch the film here and then come back for this breakdown. Let's go. As an independent filmmaker, one of our greatest challenges is often matching our budget with our imagination. We are always asking ourselves, what can we do with less? Indie filmmaking is often resource-based filmmaking. What story can you tell with what you have available to you? What elements can you bring together? Our films must be built around this principle because we don't have the one thing that can solve almost any filmmaking problem and drives most productions money. Ah! Now, my career has been one governed by the principle of resource filmmaking, of scarcity and of having to find ways to creatively tell stories that are not dictated by access to large production budgets. And this particular project was the most extreme example of this. But hopefully through this video, you'll see what is possible when you adopt an indie filmmaking mindset and make the most of your resources. It was the year 2020 and the world was experiencing something, well, let's just say starts with C and ends with vid and where I live in New Zealand was put in lockdown. This means much like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Nobody ever goes in. Nobody ever comes out. But not only that, it meant that all of us were told to stay at home, not to go to work or to visit family, not to socialize. You couldn't even order things online unless it was groceries. Nothing was happening. And as we all collectively experienced the shutdown, a lot of people lost their minds. But personally, I got inspired because this was exactly the type of environment where indie filmmakers thrive. And I asked myself, how can I tell a story and be creative within these new restrictions? Out of this question came my short horror script, Stay at Home, a short horror film about the collective paranoia and fear we were all experiencing that attempted to capture that sense of isolation and creeping dread that had afflicted us all. It was a sort of unofficial sequel to another short film I'd made several years earlier, No Caller ID, which was made in very similar, limited circumstances. First, let's talk about cheat codes or indie hacks. When you're thinking about putting together a film, we all have at least one of these. I think of this as a resource that will help your film level up that you can get easily. It might be a vintage car that your uncle owns that you can feature in the film. It might be an amazing backyard pool at your friend's house that they'll give you access to. It could be a remarkable actor you've worked with in the past that will give you their time for free. It might be a piece of equipment for a shoot, a camera, a lens set, or even a special unique prop. Any of these things can be your cheat code, your hack that you incorporate into your film that will immediately help elevate your story in some way. In this case, my cheat code is the fact that I shoot a lot of corporate and narrative work and have access to camera and sound equipment, which I own. And so I don't need to get access to the equipment I'm going to film on, which in this case would have been impossible. A second cheat code is that I was at the time living with my cinematographer, Isaac Newcomb. That meant that while we do not have a crew, between the two of us, we could perform all the duties of a crew. It just meant that every single scene, setup, and page of script would take much longer than it would if we had a full team. In terms of actors, I only had access to my partner at the time, Tisha, who was not actually an actor and had never acted in anything. I also had myself, award-winning actor of older, link in the description. So when I wasn't directing, doing B-cam, setting up sound or any of the other crew related responsibilities, I could also cameo in a couple of different roles. We also had our two dogs that could feature in the film and we had the house that we were renting in. The house had a nice backyard which we could also make use of. So I had 
one and a half actors. I'm the half. A house, some dogs, and one and a half talented crew members. I'm the half. And not much else. From these elements, I decided Tisha had to be the lead. It had to be set in our home. I wanted to feature the dogs and I would also have to be in it, but I couldn't be in it all the time as I needed to help Isaac film each scene. I created a simple story about a woman who was spending her time living alone during lockdown when she runs into a mysterious stranger who seems to begin stalking her. But is she being stalked? Or is it all in her mind? The costumes were the things we had in the house. For the stranger, a face mask, glasses to conceal his identity, a practical decision so I could play two different roles, and also represent the faceless threat of the disease. Plus, a Jedi hoodie, which I had purchased several years earlier. Thank you, Star Wars fandom. In terms of cameras, we filmed using the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro G1 as our A cam and the Blackmagic Cinema Pocket Camera 4K as our B cam. We primarily filmed on the Canon CNE Primes using the 24, 35, and 50, and also occasionally the Canon 100mm Macro for close ups. If we needed the camera to be more versatile, and for example, rig for an overhead shot, we would use the Pocket 4K. And for those curious, yes, while the cameras did match well together, you could notice a difference in dynamic range and image quality when comparing both of them. So we tried to favor the Ursa as much as possible. For lighting, it was using my Aperture 300D and Godox SL150 as our main key lights, along with the Falcon Eyes 18D flat panel light for certain scenes and an Aperture LS Mini Spotlight. We also used a lot of natural light and shot at certain times of the day rather than block light which would have required more crew and equipment. For our sound we used the Rode Go radio mic as our A mic for whenever Tisha was moving and when she was stationary we used a boom mic set up on a C stand which is a trick I often use for corporate interview work. The audio was being fed into my sound devices Mix Pre 3. We also used a small motorized slider for some shots to provide a sense of movement and make some of the cutaways feel more interesting. However, for most of the film we committed to locked off shots on a tripod with only a few small sections of the film being handheld to help accentuate the main character's sense of disorientation and fear. For tracking shots, we used the Ronin 2 Professional Combo, which just managed to handle the weight and size of the Ursa Mini Pro, but was incredibly hard to use for any long periods of time due to its weight and having no ability to pull focus remotely. We also used this to give us low angles, which our tripods would not allow. First, I began driving around the city of Auckland, collecting shots of the empty streets. This serves two purposes, one to show how the world had come to a standstill, but also to show the unique imagery and silence of a normally bustling city. Auckland always has traffic and people wandering its streets, regardless of time of day. And this was the only time you would ever see the city empty like this. And as I mentioned, whatever production value you can derive from what you have at your disposal has to be part of how you construct your resource-based stories. So what better way to capture this than with an empty city? We also used this trick for when Tisha was walking her dogs as it allowed us to walk down the middle of roads without having to worry about traffic. And this helped to create the feeling of expansive emptiness of each frame. Filming with both an A and B cam allowed us to cover scenes more quickly. Isaac would concentrate on the wider shots and anything that we would consider the most important shots, while I would shoot inserts and cutaways. I would also often look for interesting angles that we had not planned to try and provide more options for an edit. I highly recommend shooting multiple cameras when possible to save time as the first thing on a shoot you sacrifice will be your camera coverage or how many setups you do per scene. And this is always the first thing you regret when you get to the edit. Shooting with more than one camera can really help to shoot more in less time and get the angles you need while still being time efficient. However, if you're also the director, 
I don't recommend being one of those camera operators as you're always trying to concentrate on too many different things and framing shots while checking for performance and maintaining story continuity is very difficult to do. This was one of the compromises made due to our lack of crew. Tisha did her own makeup for the shoot and even slowly made herself more pale and haggard looking as the story progressed to help sell that her character was becoming more ill. This was all done with makeup she had to hand as we could not purchase any additional makeup due to the lockdown restrictions. The blood was a mixture of syrup, food colouring and chocolate sauce, the famous homemade concoction that I have used several times on many of my shoots. Most of the scenes were shot listed and we would tick off my shot list as we went. We originally estimated that it would take three days to film the short but as we began we found that because we had no real crew and even with me filming B camera everything took much longer than we expected. This is day uh, six of three days that we originally planned to film this. Tisha got our dogs to perform on camera with a mixture of treats and calling to them off screen to get their attention when we needed a certain reaction. The hardest shot was getting them both to come over and start licking her face as she was calling them but trying to remain as still as possible. We ended up adjusting this with VFX in post production. Because we had no crew it was also important to monitor continuity and we would try and film each scene sequentially to avoid continuity mistakes. This also made scenes take longer than they might have had if we'd filmed things more out of order. The scenes were filmed in a mixture of areas around the house, backyard and a nearby park, both at night time and in the day. What the shooting experience taught me is that it certainly is possible to film with no crew, but managing all these different elements means that you are more likely to make mistakes and you may not be as creative as if you were solely directing the film, as you're juggling so many responsibilities and it's hard to give any one of those tasks your full attention. If you intend to shoot a film like this and you want it to feel cinematic, then you're going to need to take your time with your setups. And this means that however long you think each scene will take, it's probably going to take much longer. It's important to be patient enough to allow for this extra time and to be prepared for it. The difference of even having just one extra person to assist with setups would have been amazing. After we finished filming, I took the film into the edit where I put it together over the course of a couple of weeks. There were a few visual effect shots required, primarily the final shot on the film which was expertly created by one of my long term VFX collaborators Tyler Adams. Uh, for reference we just filmed the shot with blood on Tisha's face and then I sent these plates off to Tyler to make his version. The other issue we had was what would be put on the television when Tisha was playing video games. We didn't want to try and get any rights or licensing to an actual video game but we wanted it to be a reference both to my first feature film I Survived a Zombie Holocaust and Resident Evil. The way around this was enlisting the help of my editor and also VFX artist Sam Wheeler who composited together some zombie game stock footage, added a background and some additional graphics and then composited it all onto the TV screen which we had added markers to to help with the tracking shot. Once the edit was done I collaborated with Tomas Iglesias, a fantastic composer who created the score for the film. For this process I pointed him to a few reference music tracks from horror films that I thought gave a similar feeling such as Hereditary and even a track from the old game Secret of Mana to try and establish the tone that I was looking for. The key for the music was to try and convey a growing illness or sickness and how that would build through the score coming to the climax of the film.
Now, as I have said many times on this channel, sound is your biggest priority. And while our recording technique on set was by no means perfect, we didn't need to do much in the way of ADR or additional dialogue recording. What we did have to do was a lot of sound design. And this is where I handed it over to the talented team at MV Studios to work on. The final step was the color grade, which was done by Dave McLaren at Color Space TV. And this was actually my first experience working with raw footage on a proper narrative project. And I was so impressed at how much more latitude was available to push and pull colors. Since then, I've really never looked back in terms of trying to film anything narrative in a raw format. And this experience informs why I think that cinema cameras aren't really cinema cameras unless you can film raw internally on them. For the look of this film, we opted to go for a little bit of a desaturated, washed out look. But as we pushed towards the end of the film and as Tisha's character got progressively sicker, we really pushed the yellows and greens. Now again, this does not make the image look pretty, it is quite unconventional, but I wanted the growing sickness represented in the colour palette of the grade. And all these things are simple subtle suggestions for the audience's subconscious. So in terms of the budget for this short and where the money was spent, the cost of production really was zero dollars, as even catering was really done completely in-house. We couldn't buy anything extra for the project and everything that was filmed was something that we already owned. Where we did spend money was on our post-production, paying for some of the VFX shots, paying for our sound mix, design and color grade, and of course paying for the musical score. Again, all of this was calling in favors and paid out of my own pocket so we're talking about very indie rates and i would guess that the total cost of all of this post work on this film came to about two thousand us dollars or just slightly over remember prioritize what you think is most important for your finished film for me that will always be the sound work because an audience will never connect with something they are struggling to hear and visually there's no point shooting raw if you're not going to have it color graded to a professional standard. But however you decide to split up your resources, remember that the story and performances will always be king. And if you have nothing else, just focus on those. Looking back on this project, I am really proud of what we we're able to achieve for so little. And I hope it inspires you to get out and start making films. I think it's important to note that while we did have some great equipment at our disposal, if we'd only had our smartphones, I'd still have made this film. The barrier to start creating isn't the equipment you have, but how you utilize it. I didn't let a global pandemic stop me, so don't let restrictions stop you. Embrace them. Construct your stories within them. Make the most of them. And just start shooting. As always, I am the Savage Filmmaker, and I'll see you when I see you.